we say ambiguity is great because that can be creative. I've got an idea, you've got an idea. Ooh, it's the connection, which is the joy. Welcome to Hack Circus. This week I meet Neil Malarkey. Neil, you might have come across before, because especially if you're a fan of comedy, he's in the Comedy Store Players, which is a really long-running, probably the most long-running improv group, and one of the best-known ones ever. They have their own theatre in London, where they play twice a week, but near Leicester Square in the centre of London, and they include people that you've probably seen if you've seen Whose Line Is It Anyway on British TV in the 90s. You'll remember Josie Lawrence and Richard Vranch, who used to play the piano on the TV show, is actually a, a, an amazing improv performer in his own right and loads of other people who I'm sure you would recognise or know uh, last time I went Phil Jupitus was there so they get they get people in from the comedy scene as well and it's it's a brilliant night still and the fact that they've known each other for so long and have had this constant contact and done this thing together every week uh, twice a week for 30 years this is just gives them this brilliant chemistry so if you like improv or you want to see something quite impressive done by these people it's a really unique night out it's really good fun neil's been in the comedy world for a while of course and is really knowledgeable about comedy so it's a real pleasure to talk to him i haven't actually seen him in real life for probably maybe seven years maybe longer than that so it was a treat to have this excuse actually to meet up with him and have a catch up so thank you uh, the listeners for giving me this opportunity i hope you enjoy this episode if you do please give us a quick star rating on itunes because that is what we will live or die by at the end of the day and if you have a bit more time then give us a review and if you don't have any time or forget to do those things please just mention this podcast to somebody I'll be back on Monday with the usual Creativity Clinic episode, but for now I hope you enjoy this chat with really lovely person, Neil Malarkey. Neil, it's so nice to see you. Hello. It's been, I don't know how many years. Some years, yes. You've been to the Comedy Store and I haven't been there. That's right, yeah. Or you have been, but you And I've forgotten you've been there, actually. Yes, Yes, you have. Yeah. You have been there, and I didn't come and say hello. So there we are. Yeah. So I've seen you, but you haven't. Yes, really that's seen true. Me. So uh, I, I should ask how you are, but is that what you want? <laughs> is that allowed? How are I you? Think so. How's Sheffield? Fine, You've, how long have you lived there? Um, four and a half years. Gosh. Yeah, it's been a while. So I think the last I was thinking about this. I think the last time I saw you was. Um, on the tube train coming back from a gig which may have been a magazine gig well I think I'd met you yes at David Schneider's house that's right yes. he'd invited people he'd never met in real life <laughs> <laughs> his Twitter chums is that right I think, I think it was met him, so. he had met him yeah, there was yeah. somebody else that he'd never met but he, yeah. he said oh it's alright she's a Twitter friend anyway so I met you at his house <laughs> and then two days later I saw you and I thought is that the same person I <laughs> met randomly and you were wearing a magazine mm shirt and you've gone to see magazine at the Royal Festival Hall. Anyway, so there you were in your magazine t-shirt and yes. I didn't realise anybody as young as you would know who magazine were. Uh, and then it turns out you're a fan of Public Image yes. Limited as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it was something you said about their lyrics were sort of, uh, they had a darkness that you appreciated. Did I say that? Something that you probably said it better than that or more interestingly, uh, but that's what I seem to remember. So yeah, magazine. I was I loved magazine when I was at school. Uh, I liked the Buzzcocks, and then I heard Real Life, their first album. I really loved. I played it to death. The light pours out of me. Yeah. Parade. Yeah. Um, but the, they weren't as popular as they should be. But most most things I like aren't that popular. Is that because I'm willfully contrary? Perhaps. Maybe you're, you're I think so. I think I probably am. Yeah. <laughs> so if it's anything's too popular, I go off it. Mm which is very shallow of me. But I really liked their stuff. So, but I'd never seen them. Right. I'd never seen them. And uh, I had tickets to see them somewhere. Uh, but I couldn't go because my son was about to be born. Some time later, I said to my wife, I'm going to go and see Magazine. And this was the gig that I claimed that I saw you at, or was afterwards. There was a man called Jeremy Vine there as well, who's off Radio 2. 
he does the lunchtime thing on Radio that 2. Jeremy Vine. That Jeremy Vine. Yeah. And he was taking Richard Sambrook, who's former head of BBC News, and I saw them. So Jeremy Vine uh, was taking Richard because uh, they take each other to see bands to kind of <laughs> intrigue and educate each other. Right. And I knew that Jeremy Vine was a fan of magazine because when he got the Radio 2 lunchtime gig, after Jimmy Young, he'd said, I like magazine and I like shot by both sides. Does anyone who's listening to this even know who the hell magazine are? <laughs> but, uh, this is the most the, the curious, the, uh, could be, could be. Uh, but Ma- Howard DeVoto was this sort of poet of the punk era. Yes, yeah. And he was in Buzzcocks and then he left Buzzcocks to form magazine, which was more sort of, I wouldn't say more musical, but it's, it had piano in it. And John Milloch, whose name I can't say, who's now yes. no longer with us, he'd been Susan the Banshees and Public Image was the guitarist and Dave Formula was uh, on piano and who's the brilliant bassist Barry Adamson Barry Adamson Barry Adamson who's very cool so yes magazine so then then we we, I would send you things about public image and magazine whenever possible and Howard Devoto left Buzzcocks and then magazine stopped in the 80s I guess and he went to work as a I think an archivist. A photo archivist. A photo, and I think yeah. he's back, probably doing that again, isn't he? Well, I think magazine imploded after a brief no, reunion. I was so. This is the thing. I was so excited because this was 2009. They came back for this revival, and it was, as you say, they, they weren't that well known as a band. So it was quite surprising they came back at all. But they were the only. It was only them and Public Image were the two bands I really ever liked. So and then suddenly around 2009, 2010, they both came back and started doing these enormous yes, concerts and yes. proper venues. So it's like you know, sort of um, Truman Show style. Like you just think the world's been designed for you. Yes. Suddenly everything was really, really exciting. Well, I'm the guest here, but I want to ask more mm. questions of you. Mm. Which is why are they the only two bands you like? <laughs> when you were know, at school and university, what, yeah. were, what were the bands that were popular, and it why was, weren't they your favourite? Sort of right. Era. Okay. Yeah, so so why, 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 why do you love Oasis or the Smiths or? Oh. I didn't, Something I didn't like that. really get into music until ah. I was kind of in my 20s at uh, university, just sort of from the end of university, really. And that's not, it's not true that they were the only two bands I liked, because I also got mysteriously into um, Stiff Records stuff mm-hmm. around that time. All good stuff. But everything, it was always like 1978 and 1982, that was well, my cut-off point. Well, that, that's the era when I was sort of creating my, or forming my musical taste. Thank you yeah. very much. Some toast is just right. Thank you very much. On, on, on a tray with lots of marmalade. Thank mm. you very much. Thank you. That because that's when I figured most people are having their tastes, mm. uh, and that's the period of music I still love the most. So really, what I just do is I've got the vinyl, then I bought the CD. Now I get it as a download. Yeah. I'm not I'm not looking for anything new, which is yes. probably bad, but I'm just looking for the new formats of what I've already got. Was I a punk? Um, I was. I was a Saturday punk. So I would go to a party on a Saturday, and in my bag I'd have my punk gear. Oh no! <laughs> so, except it was basically my brother's old clothes and a suit I'd bought in the in the charity shop, uh, which I then put on. And I do remember going to my best friend's house for a party, a teenage party, and going round the back, round the garden gate, going to his pond, which I knew he had, and making my hair. <laughs> sort of stand up the pond water the pond water yes because there wasn't gel to be had uh, I don't know what people did actually in those days I had so this pond water 1910 or something it was, 19, it was 1910 yes and I had a servant help me uh, and uh, the first world war was looming and I decided to so pond water to make my hair stand up and then there was a man I could see very scared of me sort of saying did you see the pistols at Brunel and, no not really I'm, I, I live in Surrey I can't get that far I did but I did go and see Sham 69 quite a lot oh well was my friend's brother was the bassist mm. so we got we got on the guest list sometimes uh, so yeah it's, uh, saw the Stranglers uh, uh, at Battersea Park in 1978 there was a festival with Peter Gabriel mm. Stranglers the Skids a group called London which I think John Moss played drums in off, off of Culture Club right. and there was a bloke called Johnny Rubbish who was a friend of Jean-Jacques Vernel, and uh, he was sort of he was sort of a bit like Billy Bragg. So he'd play his guitar, just do songs with him, and then people were chucking bottles at him. And he said, "One more bottle, and I leave." And a hundred bottles <laughs> <laughs> later, oh, when I went to do my gap year in Birmingham, 
hell. I did four months in Birmingham. Find I, yourself. I, 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 well, I, uh, I wanted to live in London. And I, I, not far from where I am now. We're at St Pancras. There's a thing called Community Service Volunteers. Because uh, I was very, should we say, what's the word, idealistic. Mm. So I wanted to do something to make the world a better place. So I, I went to this Community Service Volunteers. You do charity work. You get paid. I got paid £7.50 a week plus board and lodging and £7.50 for my food uh, <laughs> and so I went along saying I want to live in London because London's cool they said well you live near London you live in Surrey uh, so you have to go somewhere further afield so I lived in Birmingham in Handsworth and drove a lorry round which we around Birmingham so rich people would give us furniture and then we'd bring it to our shop and sell it or give it to poor people or um, I use these terms rotation marks obviously but and sometimes we do overnight removals if mm. there was a battered wife uh, can we say battered wife? Well, I, think, I think that's okay uh, it's probably very 80s talk but so she, had, she and her family had to get out of a flat because yeah. the, there was a violent husband or partner so we'd come and do an immediate removal wow uh, and there'd be a policeman on the door making sure mm. that the other party didn't arrive and then we'd get into a safe address so I learned about removals then and I learned how to get things around corners and stairs and I learned how smelly some lifts can be mm. in flats in blocks of flats uh, but I learned about Birmingham and I, and I could go and see gigs whenever I liked Tommy Cooper. And, no, there wasn't comedy to go and see. Really? Wasn't no. a thing. I thought, I thought comedy that wasn't was a thing. Kind of the peak of in 1910. Comedy. In 19, well, later, yeah. But when I was growing up, I was telly. There were yeah. three channels Monty Python, mm. radio. But when I was at university, alternative cabaret came. So this was a touring version of the comic strip. Or, no, it wasn't the comic strip. It was what was it, the comedy store. So the godfathers of alternative comedy Tony Allen. Andy De La Tour and Jim Barkley. So they came to play. And I, I was just blown away. I loved the whole thing. Just just couldn't get enough of it. And that's what I want to do. And then one night in the big theatre, they played a late night film, which was Richard Pryor in concert. But the support film, as it were, was the comic strip. So you can see Rick Mayo and people like that. So you've got a sense of this underground thing. So I, that's what I wanted to do with, with my life. You tell my parents. So it was that clear you just decided. Like, yeah, well, I was lucky because I went to Cambridge University, yeah. which has a thing called the Cambridge Footlights, which yeah. which is a way to get noticed. Because people like John Cleese and Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie have been in that, and Emma Thompson. Mm -hmm. So you had an, a big step up there because you had a tradition there, and there were reviews that would go on tour, go to Edinburgh and Senna at Edinburgh just because it was the footlights because of Peter Cook and all those alumni uh, but I got to be president but it did mean you could think seriously about telling your parents you want to do it as a job right. which was, was fairly unusual, most people would, wouldn't do that I think in real life they'd go and do something else uh, and then do some gigs on the circuit or, or they would have been a, an entertainer in, in the old circuit in terms of working men's clubs or cruises and stuff that was mm -hmm. a different way in but because there was this established thing so you got noticed we were able to go on tour so we, we toured around the UK most universities including Sheffield I think we played the Nelson Mandela building at Sheffield Poly as it was then okay. supporting yeah. John Dowie who's a great hero of alternative comedy and then we were in Australia and that's how we got our equity card in those days, you had to have an equity card to perform on television or in a proper theatre if you want to be an actor. And there was a bloke selling tickets for us because he'd seen on our poster that we had been in the Cambridge Footlights. So he'd heard of Peter Cook and Monty Python. he just arrived in London from Canada. He knocked on the door of the theatre and said, can I help with this show somehow? So they got him painting our set and selling our tickets. And his name is Mike Myers, mm. off of Austin Powers. But in 1985, he was somebody who had been in the touring company of Second City Canada. So Second City is uh, a very established comedy theatre, sketches and improv, started in Chicago in the 1950s, and, and loads of people have emerged from there. But I'd heard of it, unlike most English people, because I was a bit of a student of comedy, so I'd heard of Saturday Night Live, 
I loved the Blues Brothers and I just I found out that Belushi and Aykroyd had come from Second City before they went to Saturday Night Live so he was amazed and I said well what are you doing he said I'm writing sketches I said sketches man they're so old hat it's alternative <laughs> comedy so there were some venues there was the Comedy Store there was Jongleurs and there was the Earth Exchange a vegetarian cafe in Highgate and you get you get a door split which could be three pounds five pounds but you get you get a snack from the bar you know the, the vegetarian cafe so I said oh I have one of those really delicious looking chocolate sort of donut thing except it wasn't chocolate <laughs> Have you ever had carob? Yes. It was carob, which is so not chocolate. You're, compl- you're pulling a face, but you did just order some gluten-free. Too. I did, I did, but it doesn't, it doesn't taste like carob. <laughs> it's, it's not, um, you know, as disappointing as, you know, gluten-free bread isn't that far from real bread, is it? I guess. There's not... Also, this is 2016 and things yeah, have changed. Yeah, things have changed. But carob was very dull. Anyway, it looked like chocolate. Anyway, so there wasn't much it's to be had. Shock. <laughs> it was shock. It was a deeply horrible... I've never touched carob since... <laughs> Never trust a carob person. Uh, anyway, so we started, Mike and I were doing this double act called Malarkey and Myers. So I said, let's get out there. So it's sketches. And we started getting more gigs. People liked us. They said, come back and do 20 minutes. We've seen your tryout. And uh, we have gone and get booked again at Jongleurs. We started getting to go later in the bill, as it were. Um, and then we went to the Edinburgh Festival. And the venue was called McNally's, run by Karen Corum, who is the Gilded Balloon. She recently had their 30th anniversary, but the first year was at McNally's, which was just sort of cocktail bars, the, the tiny stage. You couldn't see very much if you were at the wrong place. And so we couldn't really afford anything. So we're just doing as many gigs as we can. Mm. And so literally load up the car because we had lots of props. Big mistake driving around doing five gigs one night one including the Fringe Club the Fringe Club in those days was a complete bear pit because it was somebody trying out their stuff or trying to say please come and see my show and you'd just get canned off but we didn't because we had a fail safe system because I would be in the audience shouting (laughs) and Mike would be on stage and it would be we were reenacting a sort of 1950s B movie and it was as if this was a town meeting we're both in pyjamas and dressing gown. Uh, it's a town meeting. The, this place in the Midwest yeah. has been attacked by aliens, but the aliens are really communists. So that, that was the metaphor. So I was going, oh, what, what's going on? So I was playing the whole crowd. <laughs> so if I was doing that, it who's this guy shouting? We don't need to shout. And so that eventually I got on stage. We do do our sketches, which were very physical, very visual, so we could survive in the, those tougher environments. And then a lady called Kit Hollaback was doing a show also at McNally's called Three Weeks to Live with Paul Merton and then a man called Dave Cohen. Dave Cohen is now a writer on many things, including horrible histories and Have I Got News for You? And Kit said she'd been... She'd come from San Francisco and done lots of improv, including with Robin Williams. And so she said, you sh- we should do improv. So uh, we did that. The team I've just mentioned, those three and us two, started doing improv October 95 they persuaded the comedy store to let us have Sunday nights because the comedy store was only open doing stand up on Fridays and Saturdays uh, and then there's Sundays we weren't allowed to do the whole show the first show was or oh, the first three months was stand up in the first half because they thought nobody would come and see a show that had no script so entice them with some stand up and then we could do a little bit in the second half uh, but by January the 30th, 1986, uh, we were allowed to go on show. And here we are, 31, well, 30 years later. Still so, playing twice still, a week. Well, by 89, they said, hey, you could do Wednesdays as well. We thought, yeah. oh, we should be, I'm not sure about that, because we might be dividing our own audience. We'll see what happens. First night we sold out, and we continue with Wednesdays and Sundays. And I still do that, 100 years later. So this weekend, I'm doing a. I'm trying to get back into doing more writing. I thought one way to do that would be to go on a, a comedy course. So I'm doing two days stand-up course tomorrow, and then it ends with a little show. It's the right. Laughing Horse thing, and um, yeah. yeah. So I have to write five minutes of material over the weekend, and I've just been 
because I, I write I've written hundreds of jokes in my life I've written joke books and stuff but the idea of performing jokes is completely different so I was going to get your advice to me on that <laughs> as well uh, there's a businessman I met through a friend who said I want to do some comedy and I said really are you, are you mad uh, so I was working with him yesterday I said he, he had jokes and I, I find jokes a bit lame because I've heard jokes before mm. what I want to know is stories so I just tell me about yourself and then we'll find funny in that yeah so you tell so the best comedians are the ones who, who take the making out of themselves they tell their own story so I said just tell me stuff and so I was able to write jokes with him <laughs> but he had to come in with his story so I said put in a thing there that's not true but it could be fun and then do that other story and pretend that you met somebody later on from that previous story. That's kind of comedy right. structure. Yeah. And uh, so a ba 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 ding And so he said he's actually... He lived in L.A. for a while. <laughs> he's, uh, he's Catholic, but he's <clears throat> of Indian descent. So he looks like a Muslim, but he was going to Jewish speed dating nights. <laughs> so so this is, that's just a funny sentence, isn't yes. it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, how did he get away? He said, well, because his name sounded Jewish. So he just pretended to be Jewish, <laughs> which is great because he... You know, he didn't look Jewish, and he's actually turns out he's a he's kind of Anglo Indian Catholic, which is a, a, another thing altogether. So I found it interesting because I felt I could write jokes. I've always thought I can't write jokes, I, but I could write funny. I could write some boom booms on his. So he was not structuring his joke very well. One of his jokes was how a French person saying focus sounds a bit rude. Okay, yeah. Can, Can you yeah. hear that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you don't say the rude bit at the beginning. You say, now I would say focus, but this guy was French. He's trying to say focus, but he keeps saying, and then you do the joke. You don't do it up front. So just stuff like that, shape. You delay the discovery, which you'll find over your weekend of comedy stand-up course, which is structure, which is delay the gag, rules of three, set up a rhythm and then deviate from it and then interestingly my daughter's doing a project on Commedia dell'arte and Lee Simpson some years ago told me about the Lazzi L-Z-Z-I which is a kind of a comedy bit uh, a routine I call the comedy business but my wife said what do you mean business <laughs> do you mean a business no I mean the comedy business is stuff you know mucking about business. a bit of business exactly um, so not everyone knows comedy business so for example somebody saying walk this way and then they walk in a funny way yes. okay that's yeah. that's a Lazzi it's a funny bit that doesn't move the story on but it's a thing you can put in anywhere really mm. and even if the audience seen it before they kind of like it and you can see some Lazzi's in improv where there's one where we translate somebody's going blah, 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 as if it's Estonian or something and the other say hello I'm glad to be here from Estonia and so there's a Lazzi which could be and the other person says anyway so they translate a very long thing as a short thing yes. you know it's a joke you know it's funny uh, you can't do that every time you can do one of those and it kind of keeps the rhythm going the funny while you think of something more profound to say or better <laughs> so improv is what Mike Myers taught me I'd never seen an improv show I'd heard about it but I thought they must have cheated I thought how can you make up something immediately you must cheat you must take a suggestion yeah. and then go into a some shtick you've done already it really looks like that often as well it's like how could you possibly have you know yeah. uh, that and it would make it's like watching a magic trick isn't it it would make so much yeah. more sense for them to just have a bit of rehearsal first <laughs> well I've just told you how you know there might be a thing where you do mm. Mm. Uh, a tiny thing where you say the opposite of what's just been said or you know that a three works a ba -da -ba -da -ba -ding. But you can't rely on the whole thing. It's much more entertaining when you actually play a character, tell a story. So Mike said there's this whole ethos. Improv started in the 1920s with a social worker who was helping children, some of whom didn't speak English as their first language, to become more confident, more creative in class, speak up. And so it was her son who saw the exercise and thought we can create theatre. And that became Second City in Chicago by... 1959 or so and then lots of people come through that so nowadays Tina Fey or both of those Amy women because I don't I don't know anything about comedy now I'm 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 a recovering comedian so I never watch comedy I've, I've no knowledge of what's happening in, in comedy these days and people you do comedy still You're I, I perform it on, on a Wednesday and Sunday but I don't know what's what's happening outside that small bubble mm. of which I'm part 
I used to. Uh, I, w- I was a comedy student. I loved watching current and old. I loved Laurel Hardy. Uh, when I first saw stand up, Rick Mail, Billy Connolly, I just loved it. I loved Rick Mail's character, Kevin Turvey. When I saw Comic Strip, just really liked that. Um, but now I've got no idea what's going on. I don't even know how to pronounce the famous people's names. Anyway, so. Uh, improv, Mike said, is a whole ethos. It's based on listening. How do I work with what you give me? So the idea of treating what somebody else, sells, else says as an offer, an offer to build upon. And there's a man called Rob Poynton uh, who's written a book called Everything is an Offer. But he and his group On Your Feet define an offer is something somebody gives you you can do something with. So you can see that in an improv scene, virtually anything you say is the beginning of a story. There's something there. But we will say, just get started. Just, you know, whatever it says is the right thing. So you're trying to use what the other person gave you. And once you get over the hump of thinking, I've got to do funny, the joy comes of just saying the first thing comes to you. But you've filtered it through your complete attention on the other person. So you're not thinking jokes. You're not thinking, where's this going to go next? You're just thinking, what have they said to me? How can I build on that? And our ethos is, how can I yes and that, as opposed to yes but? So yes and is a verb in itself now, pretty much. So uh, Tina Fey, in her book Bossy Pants, talks about improv a lot. There's, a, there's two pages that are really gold dust about improv, about accepting the idea, uh, accepting the offer is the same as respecting somebody else's idea. And so that's why my work is applicable in the corporate world, organisational life, where people are a bit more yes but. Uh, they may have different job titles. They may come from different parts of the business. Uh, they may have territory to defend. So the idea of an offer, and the opposite of that is a, a block. So when somebody offers you something, you say no. And of course, it's, in real life, it's not as obvious as saying no. It's mm, interesting or mm, building on that. And then they take it or diss it. So in improv, you're trying to accept the offer. Now, of course, if I say good morning to you, even that, there's two offers. Good and morning. Good? It's a terrible morning. I couldn't sleep all night. Or morning? Is it already morning? Blimey. Even two words like that, there's two offers. So the joy of yes and is I can give you my offer or offers in a sentence or physical uh, using object work, and you can take the one you choose. So you've got 100% of the story in your hands and then you pass it back to me and I've got 100%. So it's, it's 50-50 but it's 100-0 at any point. But the joy is actually becomes 100-100 because you're doing it together and I don't know where it's going to go. And when you watch an improv show the joy is we don't know where it's going to go which is kind of the opposite of what most people would think of as being a pleasant, a pleasant experience which is I need to know where this is going I need to know what the answer is I need not to be caught out and we flip it completely we're saying we're going to be caught out we're going to make a mess we're going to mishear each other we're going to be stuck for something to say so we say ambiguity is great because that can be creative I've got an idea you've got an idea Ooh, it's the connection which is the joy and a definition of creativity I heard, which is it, it's bringing together two hitherto unconnected concepts. So we don't say, oh, that doesn't work with that. We go, how can it work with that? That chicken and that elephant. And so much of creativity is that. It's things that haven't been connected before. Right, you might, they're uh, incongruous initially, but then the, it's the connection to the joy. And when you watch an improv show, Arthur Smith, who's a great comedian, he says, when you enter during the show, uh, you enter the comedy store, you just come in for a drink or something. Just the feeling in the room is different from a stand up show versus an improv show. Stand up, the audience is going, Well, I quite like this guy who's on next, or they're going, I really love this woman. I hope she doesn't stop because <laughs> she's the best. Uh, whereas with improv, it's kind of, oh, What are they going to do? You're more on the edge of your seat, but more people are invested in it because they know it's unique to them and they know it's not going to be done again another night. Although we perform Wednesdays and Sundays, every show is unique. We have the same games we play, but the audience is more invested. And the moments of failure, which is when, oh, what, 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 I'm there, that wasn't quite right, or I misheard you, become moments of joy. And sometimes the mistake, the mishearing, can become a spine of the whole story. And 
there may be a bit where somebody talks about nuclear physics. It's much funnier to go in and say, I want the Gregaton and the Piddledom and the Finglom. You make words up mm. than if you really know about nuclear physics. And that joy of not knowing is what makes improv so infectious. Improv is not just random, spontaneous. It's a form of collaborating. And also, it's a form of writing, if you like. You can do it solo, which is almost let the pen tell you. And all writers will, well, many writers will tell you, they, they don't know their process. They'd rather not know what it is. They just sit, and the main thing is look at the paper, be in the chair, or whatever, rather than waiting for inspiration. Some days are good, some days are not so good. So yes, there was a point in my life where I looked at my life and said, okay, improv says where we got to is the right answer. (laughs) What are the offers in this, where we are now? And I thought, well, actually, yeah, I quite like the things I've chosen to do. (laughs) Because there could be a point in your life, if you've done too much improv, where you see people who write things doing really well. Because they've written a book or they've written a TV series and that leads to a film and they and you think I, I, I spend four hours a week just improvising and then it's gone if I bottle that creativity would I have done better and so there was a kind of period of self flagellation thinking why haven't I worked harder and then I thought actually hang on a minute you're not completely stupid you've chosen to do this thing you get a lot out of it and it delights 400 people a show 800 people a week that's fine that's great and it's you it's who you are you you can still do some writing but don't worry about what you didn't do Uh, you say it's a philosophy for life it is on the other hand a lot of people do want some structure but that's why I say enough structure here there's lots of business types here whereas Leila and I ponce around a bit freelance and I've never had a proper job I've never... You did the van thing. You're telling me... That was kind of proper, but I think it was that. I think it was that. I wasn't in an office, maybe. And I wasn't in the same place every day. We did start at the the shop. But I think it was that where I thought, oh, right, all this stuff is going on in the day, nine to five. I don't want ever to be stuck in the same place for that long. So I was on the road quite a lot and outdoors. So... It's funny because people often ask me, uh, how, one thing is, oh, you, you do comedy, really? Is that your hobby? No, it's my job. Or they go, wow, how brave you were to choose this as a career. And I wasn't that brave. I just couldn't, I couldn't imagine myself not doing it. There'd be times when I thought, hang on a minute, what's going on? Look at all these other people who have got a structure. They've, they've risen up the ladder of success and become the boss or higher up the ladder Um, but I I just couldn't do that in some way my wanting to do the business stuff that I do was an answer to a question of thinking I don't want to be doing comedy forever and I noticed there was quite a lot of stuff I did that I didn't really enjoy so I, I you've never had to do this but you might have people friends commercials casting for commercials so they they get the phone call on a Monday for a Tuesday or a Wednesday saying they need a a nice young comedy chap and quite often when you can't be in or couldn't be in a beer commercial until you were 25 so when I got to 25 there were beer commercials casting every week and you turn up and there's a hundred other blokes who look like you who put a suit on or a lumberjack shirt whatever is required in the brief and you go into the audition and you can sense the director going no not you <laughs> but then you have to go through an audition um, um, and I was never very good at panel games to be honest with you They're quite you have to have a strong persona and any subject how can I use my persona on that am I, am I cynical yes. am I crazy yes. am I uh, uh, going to take a weird take on it and I was just I, I'm much more used to because I come from more acting, review, sketched land, where I play a character. So I found that and those, those things you need to do to get on in comedy. 
but now I've, I've the thing I love doing is the comedy store players and that's the only show that I do really most of my stuff is, is running workshops here there and everywhere do you think that improv in in TV is having a bit of a resurgence. I think about Outnumbered as a kind of way of improvising a whole sitcom. I think Outnumbered was was brilliant because you often see child actors and they're not very good. Mm. And so Andy Hamilton uh, and Guy Jenkin deliberately said, how can we make it more natural? So they knew that with modern cameras they didn't have to do makeup mm. and they could shoot it one way with the child sort of with a scenario but then the child would find great words to do that and they knew that they could send the child away back to school or whatever the chaperone they were not allowed to do too many hours in a day and they could kind of get the adults adults to fill in the bits to make sense of it so it does work really well doesn't it it's got the best of all worlds which is you've got good comedy writers in charge with also the magic of Improvisation and children being creative rather than mouthing lines that a grown up is think, thinking they might be funny. So I think, I think that is the way forward, which you can do because it's not that expensive. It used to be expensive to film things, now it's much cheaper. So I, th I think that is the way. I do believe that a lot of people in movies now, they're kind of scenarioed. Can you spot the. I don't, I don't know that I. I mean, yeah. I don't know that I can. A really good actor will act such that they are you think they're improvising but a lot of the people in the in those kind of um, Judd Apatow movies have come from an improv background but the the clever thing they do is good writing as well so they've got the best of all worlds so for example my, Austin Powers Mike Myers uh, Jay Roach is a, a very good director they would do the script and then sort of let Mike do a go off and see what happened so you then had two takes, or many more than two takes, but you had two kind of angles to go with. And so you could accommodate the improv or just decide the script was fine as it was. And if you've got the luxury to do that, you will get the best of all worlds. Uh, but to allow improv, you've got to know a little bit about where your cameras are. Because you either shoot a two-shot, because uh, so Spinal Tap and uh, Christopher Guest movies... He has something like 55 hours of film and he spends a year and a half editing it down to a feature length. The danger of improv on film, TV, audio is actually to work, it has to be well edited counterintuitively. And that's where Whose Line Is Anyway succeeded because you had the Clive Anderson energy of buzzing in, keeping it moving uh, with the audience in the background. They'd done a lot of improv TV before that never really worked. It, just, it looks wooden, leaden. Because it does. If you just shot an improv show, it looks like really badly written stuff. Yeah. Why, why, why don't they just write something? Whereas Whose Line uh, was shot well, shot wide, so that you could see what was going. Because often it, I react to you and you need to see me at the same time as you do whatever. You had Clive Anderson you could cut to and keep it moving. So you do an hour, uh, instead of a five minute sketch, you do a one minute sketch just because television eats up time differently. So that's why Whose Line worked. But that is the danger of improv. It just looks a bit fl flabby <laughs> once it's committed to celluloid or tape. Can you bear to spend time with the other comedy store players outside of your working <laughs> time? I mean, you've, you've been together in Versa Comedies for 30 years and you see them... Twice a week. Twice a week, yeah. It's yes, we do. We, we, we have it's, it's a good point, actually. It's time we had a lunch. We do have lunch every now and again. We take oh, nice. the man who owns the comedy store out for lunch. And we love each other dearly. When we were younger, we used to go out every after every show and carousing. Now we're too old to, to do that, so we, we go home fairly soon. But, uh, yes, you know, they're my family. They're my comedy family. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Isn't he great? If you're interested in creativity and different techniques to get motivated or make things, 
then you can also subscribe to a weekly newsletter I'm doing by going to laylajohnston.com forward slash newsletter. And then you'll get a short email with some practical tips and ideas and thoughts and things once a week for 12 weeks in your inbox. If you have any feedback or anything you want to talk to me about, you can get in touch on Twitter at Hack Circus, Facebook at Hack Circus Podcast, uh, by email, editor at hackcircus.com. We're even on Snapchat and IRC. We have an IRC channel. So there are loads of ways to get in touch if you would like to. It's always great to hear from you. And I'll see you again next week. <laughs>